Father, we thank you right now, God. Thank you for your son, Jesus. We sing this song to, to hail King Jesus. And Lord, we are thankful that you have given us the opportunity to know your son. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have pursued us and known us and given us the opportunity to step into a relationship with you through faith in Jesus. Lord, I pray over this service today that as we go to your word now, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts, our souls, our minds, our spirit, God. And Lord, those things inside of us that, that cry out and try to cause fear and chaos and panic, all of those things, Lord, we lay it at your feet. Holy Spirit of God, we ask you right now to fill this room with your presence. Speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys turn around and shake hands with somebody. Give somebody a, a high five or a hug a neck if you can. All right, you guys look great out there. Um, glad to see everyone here. Man, Merry Christmas. We'll say it again. And so I want to just begin by, uh, by asking you a question. Let's just start with a question. How in the world are you doing? Like, like, how are you doing with this Christmas season, right? This thing is on us. You get it that a week from now, it'll be Christmas Eve. Next day, uh, well, actually Christmas a week from now. And by the way, how many of y'all believe it's going to snow next week? How many of y'all are praying that it doesn't snow next week? Yeah, okay, 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 all right. All right, another, another little survey. Let's do a little survey. Uh, how many of you have bought all of your presents, already have them wrapped in under the tree? Where are y'all weirdos? I mean, where are y'all at? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. How many of you have not bought one present yet? Let me see that. Okay, right, 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 all right. Well, listen, listen, I get it, man. Uh, it's that time of year, and, and the pressure has begun, and so um, I'm just checking in because this time of year can be filled with all kinds of pressure, and it starts with all of these presents and gifts and parties, all of those kinds of pressure. What pressure are you talking about, Jeff? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you, like us, have more kids than we know how to count, and it feels like at Christmas time, uh, it feels like you're going to have to buy more presents than the GDP of the nation of Australia, right? Uh, the financial deal. Uh, how many of you know right now that there's a party on your calendar that you're going to have to go to, and you would rather shove bamboo spikes under your fingernails and go to that party? Yep, I see that hand. Uh-huh. Um, Right. There's all kinds of pressure on us, man. There's pressure to cook for your husband's family, for all of them. There's pressure to make sure that your kids have all those precious memories. Heaven forbid that we miss out and our kids grow up and not see the lights or drink the hot chocolate or get on Santa Claus's Polar Express or whatever it is. And then all of us have that one kid, right? You have that pressure of little Johnny who, who never does one thing you ask him to do. His room is a hot mess. He leaves every spoon on the couch. He's doing his best to hold down a D-plus average right now, right? And you, and you got to get little Johnny the perfect gift. And don't forget to fill up his stocking too, right? Right, right, right. Well, if that's you, you got that kind of pressure, hang in there, man, because January is coming. It's not going to last forever. I want to talk to you today about being under pressure um, because I think we're going to see this in the Christmas story this morning. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were playing around with the grandkids, and Jackie had a nativity set that she had out, was kind of putting it all together, and she was asking the little kids, uh, four grandkids, they were all beautifully up here, man, can we just give these kids a big round of applause, by the way? <laughs> Did they do a great job? Man, did y'all see the fear and terror in some of those kids' eyeballs? Lord bless them. <laughs> we were messing around with a little nativity set, or where I come from, it's the nativity set, that's right. Anyway, messing around with the kids, we're putting the thing together, and they were looking at it, and we were talking about it, and you look at that nativity set, or maybe you drive by the live thing, and we have a tendency to, see, tendency to say, wow, how beautiful is that story? Yeah, 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 well, it is for us looking at it from today, but you know, when you think about Mary and Joseph, they were really just kids, teenagers really, and most likely they were teenagers, and those kids had a ton of pressure on them. Uh, we'll talk about that some more in a moment, but I want to go back into the, the, the Christmas story that's found in Luke chapter 2. And in this story, what I want you to get out of today, now listen, if you've already checked out on me, if you're thinking this is going to be a history lesson, here's what I want you to hear. I want you to see how some of the events that took place in Luke 2 coincide with pressure that you may have in your life right now. You're going to see your life 
in some ways in the scripture this morning. So if you picked up a handout when you were coming in and you're the kind of person that likes to take notes and refer back to it later on, here's your first little thing where you got some blanks there. Write this down. Uh, we live in a world full of pressure. Yep, we do. We live in a world full of pressure. And so we go to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Start with verse 1 there. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Now, Caesar Augustus is the Caesar uh, over all of Rome. And if you remember your, your history lessons from school, it said all roads lead to Rome. The Roman Empire had conquered all of the known world. And when the Caesar put out a, a decree, everyone had to follow it. So he, he gives a decree that a census, let's go count all of the people, should be taken of the entire Roman world. Well, that's basically the known world at that time. So wherever you were, you're part of this. So it says this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Everyone went to his own town to register. So what that meant was if, if you now live in, in Danville, Virginia, but your family's from Bluefield, West Virginia, then you got to go back to where the family's from and be counted there, no matter where that is. Now, let's just be real for a minute. If you're Joseph, if you're Joseph in this story, you know Joseph and Mary, the parents uh, of baby Jesus. If you're Joseph in this story, can you imagine putting yourself in that young man's shoes and thinking about the pressure that he already has on himself? He's got a baby on the way. He has a wife. Well, not actually a wife. It's a, not actually a fiancé. It's what they call betrothal in those days. And, and to be betrothed to someone simply meant that, that we've made a pact that we're going to get married. We're not yet married. We're not living together. But, but in about a year's time, we're going to get married. That's what Mary and Joseph had done. They'd made this arrangement. And so can you imagine, man, if you're the parents, right? Here's the parents of, of Mary who's trying to figure out how to tell people, I know, right, she's pregnant, but, but, but she didn't do anything wrong. Really? It's God's baby. Y'all try that on. See how that works for you, right? Here's, here's Joseph's parents who are saying, son, are you sure this is the one you want to marry? Because, I mean, I know she seems like a good kid, but Joseph, did you happen to notice that she's pregnant, right? There's that whole tension going on. There's Mary who's trying to say, look, I know, I know, I know, but I didn't do it. It's God's baby. And then there's Joseph who's saying, man, I got my parents on me. I got her parents on me. I got Mary looking at me like I didn't do it. All this pressure. And now Caesar and all of his infinite wisdom, Joseph's got to be saying, okay, whatever. Cool. Caesar, you want me to go back to, back to my hometown and do this thing? You realize that that means that I got to go about 90 miles. Yep, that's what you have to do. To pay my taxes. Yep, that's what you have to do. And you know what that is, man? That's some pressure. But you know this already in your life. Pressure does not stay stagnant. What does pressure do? Pressure always builds. Pressure always builds. So write this down. Pressure has a way of multiplying. Let's see how it multiplies in Joseph's life. So now Joseph's got all this family stuff going on. He's being told he's got to take this journey. He's got to do all the things. In verse 4, it continues and says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So we've got to go from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Man, it's not bad enough that now i got all these family members that's acting some kind of way about this situation. It's not bad enough that I've got to go 90 miles. Come on, y'all, now. Now, listen, if you're going to drive, some of y'all would pitch a fit if you had to drive 90 miles today, about an hour and a half. This brother had to take a donkey and a very pregnant fiancé, whatever you want to call it. She's talking about, oh, my back, every three steps. He's like, you better get to walking. Well, my feet hurt. Well, get on the donkey and ride. The donkey bucks me, and I ride like this. Just hush. Hush, woman, right? That's, that's what he's dealing with. The pressure has a way of building. But you know what? If you bring that back to our lives, we know what it's like. Pressure builds in your life. You think things are, are going okay one day, and then a thing happens, and then the pressure starts to build, right? You've all been there. Like you get, you get a call from your boss, and he says, hey, come in the office. You go into the office, and he sits you down, and he says, man, um, I got to talk to you. Things have changed, and you've done a really good job. You've done a really good job. You, you really worked out well for us, but there's some things out of my control, and I'm going to have to let you go. 
Like, what? Let me go. I'm going to have to lay you off, man. Things just aren't working out well. It's not your fault. You've done a great job. But I'm going to have to let you go. If things change, I'll call you back. But I'm sorry. i got to let you go. You're, you're just, your whole world's spinning. How am I going to make a house payment? How am I going to buy diapers? How am I going to do the thing? And on the way home, the transmission falls out of your car. <laughs> man, what's going on? The pressure's building. Maybe you're a student, and you've been, you've, been, you've been trying to work at this thing all semester, right? You're working at this thing, and but, but, but finals are coming. They're right around the corner, and you already know that you don't know what you're supposed to know to do the test. And then you get a call from home that says, hey, Grandma's not doing well. You need to, you need to get here. Wait a minute. I was, I was, I was kind of waiting. I was gonna, I'm already behind. I was planning on, on studying, and now I don't have time to do that. What am I going to do? Yeah, that's right. What are you going to do? Because the pressure is building. And the pressure was building on Mary and Joseph in all kinds of ways, man. It has a way of building. Well, if you think that's the end of the road, I got one more for you. When you think that, the, that, that this is bad, hold on. It's like, Jeff, man, I came here today to hear a positive message. Well, I am positive. I'm positive, but it's going to get rough before it gets better. Come on, somebody. Positive. Go back to verse 6. It says, while they were there... The time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. Now, let me get this straight. i got to walk 90 miles so this guy can be satisfied that, that I'm counted as one of his. When I get there, I have to pay this exorbitant amount of taxes <clears throat> and, and by the way, let's just chase a rabbit just a minute. Am I the only one that thinks it's crazy that Pennsylvania County has decided to charge me for all these taxes right here when Christmas is due? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're going to have an uprising here. Come on, we can build something. Right? I mean, I know, I know they send that thing that says you can pay half of it in July, but come on, let's be real. Ain't nobody paying it in July. Right. Anyway, 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 they, they, they've taken this, this, this journey. They've gotten there. Now I've got my pregnant fiance who's grumbling all the way. Now I'm late. And now we finally get to Bethlehem. And, and we get there, and there's nowhere to stay. Can you imagine what that part of it would had to be like? like? Like if you've ever been on a trip, even in a car, there's delays that take place. You know, everybody in the car got to pee somewhere along the way. Are we there? Can we stop and get gas? Can we go to McDonald's? Well, these guys are going along the way, and I'm sure that they rolled into Bethlehem later than they thought. And they get there, and all of a sudden, they have to realize we're not the only ones who have come for the census. This is the season for the census. It's the season to pay the taxes. So we roll in a couple of days late, and, and, and I guess Joseph just thought, I'm going to come into town, and I'll go to an inn, and we'll get a room. Well, guess what, Joseph? Uh, this is Martinsville Race Weekend in Bethlehem, right? <laughs> That's what we're dealing with. And everybody's already got all of the rooms. Brother goes to one hotel, and they're like, no, nah, we're out. You should have been here two days ago. Well, I tried. It's her fault. She wouldn't pick up her fat feet and come on. But anyway, he, he didn't say that. I, he didn't say that. Anyway, goes to one end, goes to another, goes to another, can't find a room. Finally, somebody says, look, we don't have any rooms. We don't have any rooms, but there is a barn back there. There's a barn, and hey, honey, can he stay in the barn? I don't care. Just leave me alone. All these people coming. Yeah, if you want to go in the barn, they go in the barn, and the baby is born. And here is God coming out of heaven into this world, being born as a baby in a little stable placed in a manger. A, you know what a manger is, man? I mean, that's the, the trough where they would feed the animals. And that's where Jesus was placed. Man, Joseph and Mary just had to shake their head and say, what in the world? What in the world is going on? I didn't expect that it was going to be like this. Can I ask you a question? Do you ever do that? Do you ever look at your own life and shake your head and say, man, I never knew it was going to be like this. Maybe you had it planned out and you thought everything was going to be different in some way. And you look at your life now and it's nothing like what you had expected it would be. And you feel the pressure. Come on, we've all lived under this thing of the holiday season. The Christmas season is supposed to be the hap, hap, happiest time of the year. We go to the parties and we, and we, we do the events. And on one hand, yeah, it's happy and it's good to be around family and we smile and we laugh. 
But for, especially for people of a certain age, and I certainly am one of those men, there's this thing inside of a lot of us that says, man, I love Christmas, I love the holidays, but I think back on when I used to go to grandma's house or when I used to go to my parents' house. And there can be this thing of, of such great loss, and it can just settle down on you like a wet blanket. And this dichotomy of, 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 yes, the happiest time of the year, but it's also this sad time of memories. So many people deal with so many hard things during this time of year. And it doesn't seem to let up. It, just like with Joseph and Mary, it comes, in, it comes in waves. It comes in waves. And sometimes it just feels like the pressure to buy the, the right presents, the pressure to spend the money that I don't already have. Yeah, I'll put it on the card and I'll pay for it next year. Right? The pressure to, 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 to make the in-laws happy. The pressure to get to my parents' house and then her parents' house and then to spend time with the kids and they got this thing at church and then I got to be over here in this work part. The pressure, it comes in waves and it can just be too much. So here's my question. What can you do when the pressure is just too much? What can you do? You got to do something, right? What can you do when the pressure's too much? Well, I'm going to give you two options. The first option Truth of it is, man, you can just give up. You can. You can give up. That is an option. You say, how do you know, Jeff? Because I gave up in November. I say, what are you talking about? Come on, y'all, man. I mean, I really tried. Come on now. Y'all got to believe me when I tell you this. I didn't do great. I mean, I'm not like Jackie Lynch who rolls out of the bed at 4 o'clock every morning and goes to the gym. But I really tried to be healthier this year. Come on, man. Why are you looking at me that way, man? You, you don't believe me? I tried to go to the gym some. I tried to quit eating some of the stuff that I'm not supposed to eat. Tried to eat some of the healthier stuff. Listen, I'm never going to be down with that cauliflower pizza thing. You can forget it. Um, anyway, whatever. I tried. But man, long about November, they started talking about Thanksgiving. I'm like, ooh, my ear's perking up. What are we going to have? Right? Talking about some, some, some macaroni and cheese and some deep fried turkey. Yes, bring it on stuffing. We would like that. Allie brings the corn pudding. Come on, Allie, you're a pro. You're, you're a legend for that corn pudding, right? All of that stuff. And then they started talking about Christmas. And man, I can't help myself when they bring out the Queen Anne's chocolate covered cherries where my people at. Somebody say amen. Yes. Yes, I about got a fight started on Facebook over that thing. All the good stuff, the little Buckeyes, I love those things. The chocolate cover, peanut butter, and the butterscotch, pay, uh, what do you call them, haystacks. Brother hadn't said no to a one of them yet. Come on. <laughs> Just gave up on the thing. I'm going to eat it all. We'll start over in January. But some of you, man, that's funny in a way, but some of you think, man, I know what it feels like to give up. Like, 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 like some, there are a lot of people who give up and say, you know what, man, I've tried to quit, quit drinking, or I've qu tried to quit smoking weed, or I've tried to quit doing some things. You know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to keep drinking. You, why do you keep drinking? I had a guy tell me this one time. He said, so why, 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 are you, why are you still struggling with it, man? You've been trying to quit for a long time. He said, I'm not trying to quit. I said, what? He said, no, I like it. I like how I feel when I'm drunk. Okay, I'll quit preaching now. Um, Serious story. But, but there are people, sometimes we get to that place where we just give up, and, and this is what makes me feel good. And it's the only time that I feel good. Pain pursues pleasure, right? And this is a pleasure that I can, I can either feel nothing or I can feel good. I can either feel anxious or I can, I can delay it all. And some of us have just given up, and we've decided that that's what I'm going to do. And you look at yourself, and you say, well, what harm is it doing? Ask the people around you. They'll tell you it's affecting your relationship. It's affecting your job. It's affecting your finances. It's affecting your future. It's affecting your health. But you've given up. On a more serious note, way more serious note, could be some of you here this morning when I talk about the sadness and the depression that comes around the holiday season. Man, I pray against this thing, but there's a spirit that wants people to just give up on life. There is a demonic power that wants to convince you that what you're going through is just the way it is and that it's never going to get any better. There's a spirit that would say to you, they would be better off without you. By the way, that's not the voice of God. There is a spirit that would say to you, just give up. I don't want to feel it anymore. You got a choice. You can either give up or you can look up. Now, I, I appreciate the amens, but I fully realize that's a corny saying, right? You know, give up or look up. Come on, somebody. Ha! Right? You can give up or you can look up. Well, it is kind of corny, but it's true. And it's true because when you look at the Christmas story, remember the Magi, the wise men? 
Man, these wise men, they, they, were, they were called by God to go to where the Messiah, the baby, was going to be born. They didn't have a map quest. They didn't have a GPS. They didn't have any way of knowing how to get there, but they just started going. And God told them, I'm going to put a star in the sky. And if you'll look up to that star, and they saw the star, and they started following the star, you know the story, the star led them right to the manger where Jesus was born. What's my point to that? They had to look up to find the star, to find out how to get to where God wanted them to go. And some of you this morning, you've been in such a long season in your life of looking at your circumstances. All you've seen is the ground that you're standing on. Or maybe you've been able to look up, but all you can see are the trees around you. And all you know is, is, is what I know. This is what I'm accustomed to. And I can't see a way out. And I see a wall and I see a block. And I don't see a way out. And hope begins to flee. And you begin to get depressed. And you begin to think this is all there is. And God says, look up. And when you look up, there is a God in heaven. Come on, can I just tell you? There is a God in heaven who, who, who cooked up this plan for your life. He created you before the foundations of the world. He built everything into you that is there. He created you a specific way. He even allowed the circumstances in your life to take you where you've been. Some of y'all are scratching your head saying, why did I marry that first fool I was married to? Well, God probably didn't sanction that thing, but he can work with it. He can work with it, right? right? Why, why did I take that job and spend five years? Well, God never told you to go there. You thought that's what you were supposed to do. But God can work with it. He can work with it. He knows everything that's in you. He knows everything you've done, and he can make all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. But you don't know what his purpose is because you're not looking to him. You're looking at your circumstances. You're looking at the people around you. You're looking at your checkbook that's telling you, I don't have any money. But God is saying to you, I'll give you. Money is not what you're after. You want life. You want life. You want joy and adventure and purpose and meaning. And you want to know that when they plant your tail in the ground one day that you've made a difference in this world and you've glorified the king and there are people who will be affected long after you're gone because of your life. If you're living today with no hope, could I encourage you? Don't give up. Look up. Look up and say, God, you can say this to him. God, if you're there, I need to know you. God, if you have a plan for my life, I want to know about it. Watch out, because that can start you on a journey that can take you to places you never imagined. Um, I want to show you this in the Scripture. Because of Jesus, because of Jesus, you are not in this alone. We'll jump out of Luke for a minute, go to another version of the Christmas story that's recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and it says, All this took place, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him, I love this word, Emmanuel, which means God with us. What? Jesus came into this world and they called him God with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not God who's out there in some foreign planet watching over things. He's right here. And because the Holy Spirit now dwells inside of people who have given their life to Christ, he lives inside of us. If you're a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit of God guiding you and leading you in your, in your directions. If you don't follow Jesus, you do not have the Holy Spirit, which is why you're constantly running into roadblocks, which is constantly why you're trying to figure out how to live your life on your own, which is constantly why you stay stuck. You have a choice. You can either let God be God in your life, or you can continue to choose to try to be God in your own life. You were created to worship God, not to be God. Does that make sense? If you're trying to organize everything and make every decision in your life, you have set yourself up to be the God of your own life. And he's saying, listen, son, listen, daughter, I love you, and I know you're struggling with some things, but you don't have to. I can show you the way if you'll just connect with me. If you'll just allow me, I am Emmanuel. I want to show you one more verse of Scripture, actually two verses in one place. And I love this little passage found in John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You've probably heard John 3, 16, even if you've never gone to church. You've seen it at a football game or heard it somewhere along the way. But it's not just a, a, little, <coughs> a little statement that's taken out of Scripture. This is an actual conversation that Jesus is having with a man named Nicodemus. 
And Nicodemus was a, a Pharisee. He's a, he was even a leader of the Pharisees, and he was, he was a very religious, very scholarly man. He knew all of the law of Moses, would have memorized the first five books of, of what we call the Bible, the Pentateuch. He would have memorized all of those things, uh, kind of a lawyer of his time. And he starts seeing these miracles that Jesus is doing firsthand. And he's hearing from other people about them. And Jesus is beginning to, to cause a little ruckus everywhere he's going. And so Nicodemus arranges a meeting to get together to have a conversation with Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I don't understand. Jesus is like, what, what don't you understand? He says, if you want to know God, it's not about knowing the Scriptures. It's about knowing my Father. And he says, you can't know my Father unless you're born again. Nicodemus says, huh? Kind of like our bulldog kind of cocks his head to the side. Huh? What are you talking about? Be born again. He even says, can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? He said, he said that. Jesus is like, man, you don't get it. You are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things. Jesus says to him, the wind. You feel that wind that's blowing right now? You don't know where it's coming from, but you feel it, right? You can hear it. It's real. And unless a man is born of the Spirit and born of water, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is having this conversation with him, and that takes us to verse 16. And Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to see, man, you may know all of these things, and you may have even done bad things in your life, but God has a plan for your life. And I think he would say the same thing to us this morning. In verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Now stop right there. Your mind for a lot of you continues and finishes that. It says, if you believe in him, you'll not perish. How many of y'all know that, that perishing is not just about what happens in the afterlife? Yes, there's a reality of heaven and hell, but there are people around us, people amongst us even now, who are perishing every day where we're living and breathing, but we're dying on the inside. Jesus says, if you follow me, that perishing, that dying will stop and the coming alive will begin to take place. He who believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then I love verse 17. It gets left out a lot of times. But Jesus continues, says, so God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, that the world might be saved. Man, I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what your version of God is. In other words, I don't know. Like If I, if I ask you the question, who is God? I don't know how you would answer that. Some people would say, yeah, I don't even want to talk about God because what I know about God is he's mean and he's angry. You have this picture. Lots of people have this picture that God just wants to write down all of the things that I've done wrong and, my God, I know I've done a lot of them. And God just wants to bring all of those things to the, to the forefront and say, you did this, so this is the price you're going to have to pay. A lot of folks operate in their life as if, as if heaven and hell is this thing that's based on some cosmic scale. And if I do more good in my life to heavily weight the scale to my favor than I've done bad, then I get in. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture doesn't say it's about whether you're good or bad. The Scripture says it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's a free gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What does that all mean? It means... It means God wants you to know that he is filled with love and mercy and compassion and grace. Whatever you've done in your life, I think this is the best deal you're ever going to hear. God's willing to say to you, whatever your past looks like, whatever your past looks like, if you're willing to make a trade with me, everything can be different. And maybe you would perk up a little bit right there and say, okay, you got my interest. What's the trade? He would say, well, all of that baggage you're carrying around with you, all that stuff is keeping you stuck in where you are. You think about the things they've called you, the things people say about you. You think about the things that you've done. You even think about how you've identified yourself, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you've just decided that I am what they say I am. God would say to you, take all of that, all of that sin, all of that angst, all of that anger, all of that shame, if you'll just lay it down at my feet, we'll make a trade. You give me all of that, and because Jesus went to the cross, I'll give you a new life. Some of y'all hear that and you say, that can't be true. It can't be that simple. I didn't make it up. It's what the Scripture says. He says, if you will follow me, 
whoever believes in him shall not perish. Now, believe doesn't just mean that he came into the world, he existed, and he lived. Believe means that I believe that he is the Messiah. I believe that he is the one that can give me life and hope and a future and everything that I long for. And I'm willing to step into that. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. You know, here's the last thing, man. Jesus came to take the pressure off of you. We're all under pressure. Some of it is our own doing. Some of it we choose to stay under. But whatever your pressure is today, wherever you are in your relationship with God, whether you would say, man, I'm, I'm as lost as a duck in a windstorm, or if you would say, man, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. All of us have pressure. And whatever your pressure is, Jesus came to take that pressure off of you. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right there where you are? Can I just pray for you? Now, can I just I feel in my spirit, man? I don't know if the Holy Spirit's telling me this or what it is, but I just feel in my spirit that there are some people right here today who are struggling with some things feeling a weight on you. That thing of being under pressure resonates with you in lots of ways. If that's you right now, you say, man, I'm struggling with this thing. Jeff, if you're going to pray, would you just pray for me? Would you raise your hand if I can pray for you? Yeah, thank you. Come on. Yeah, thank you. I see those hands. You can put them down. Father, I thank you for your people. God, I'm, I'm, I sense in this room this morning that there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of people who've been through some things. And Lord, knowing your heart, knowing how you are a healer and you are a redeemer and you love to do the miraculous. You love to turn things around. You would love to make some changes in some people's hearts this morning. God, for every person who's raised their hand right now and said, I'm struggling with some things, Jeff, pray for me. Father, we lift them up to you right now. Lots of other people are struggling with things that didn't raise their hand, but you know that too, Lord. God, I pray that right now that through faith, Every one of your children that's hearing this message will find a sense of relief in knowing that we're not in this alone. Emmanuel, God is with us. I pray for your children right now. As you continue to pray with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I got to tell you, man, there are a whole reason that Jesus came into this world is to save lost sinners. And every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is a sinner by nature. And it is our sin. We can dumb it down and try to pretty it up as however we want to. But let's make no mistake about it. Sin is simply missing the mark that God has set for us. And all of us are sinners. And because of our sin, truth of the matter is, man, without Jesus, we're separated from God. We don't have a relationship with Him. But because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of the blood that He gave to pay the price, to purchase our salvation, we have hope. My guess is in a room with this many people today, there's probably some folks here today who you know that your sin is ever before you. And you may not want to call it that. You may not even like that term sin. It may be too antique, old-fashioned, whatever for you. But it is what it is. That's what God calls it. And God's saying to you this morning, listen, child, I love you, and I want better for you. But the sin is what's keeping you away from me. Today, God wants to make an offer to you. And that offer is if you'll give him all of your junk, he'll take the sin away. He's already paid the price. And he will give you eternal life. He'll give you life in the right now. So with nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. This is between you and God. But I'm going to count from three to one. And I believe there's some folks that want to take God up on that deal. If that's you, when I count down to one, would you just raise your hand? Three, two, one. Raise your hand. Yes, yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Seven. Praise God. I thank you. Father, you see these hands. You know these hearts, God. You know the hearts of people who are desperate for you. Lord, give a sense of peace right now to people who are saying, Lord, I give you my life. God, I pray that through this church or maybe another church, however you choose to work it, that you will put disciple makers in front of every person who has given their life to you right now. And Lord, I pray that you'll guide them into a brand new life. God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for being with us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.